I'm going to jump in here. Um, my name is Jesse Barnes. I work in the Intel Open Source Technology Center with, with Daniel, who just presented, and several others uh, who, are, who are here today on the i915 graphics driver primarily, and then miscellaneous other GPU-related stuff inside of Intel. Uh, today, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about um, the Intel Baytrail platform. And I had actually wanted to cover this last year, but I only got approval to talk about anything in any detail this year, so push forward. Um, so some of this may not be uh, totally new to you, especially if you've been reviewing what, what came out of IDF uh, a couple of months ago on Baytrail. But um, this is something I'm really excited about because it's a, it's a, a new SOC for us um, in a couple of ways. It's got a, a, a new CPU, um, a redesigned Atom CPU, and a, uh, and a new GPU relative to our previous SOC products. So it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting. And we've also been involved on, on the, the bring up and some of the design work from very early on in the open source side of things. So it's, it's exciting for us from that perspective as well. It uh, wasn't just totally driven by Windows stuff or, or powered on solely with Windows, that sort of thing. So anyway, like I said, this is a, um, a, a new SOC um, specifically focused at like the tablet market and convertible market. Um, not, uh, it's not designed to go into phones. Uh, it doesn't quite have the, the power envelope that you would need for that and the level of integration you need for that, but it does make a pretty decent tablet chip. It's working, or it's fabbed on our, our 22 nanometer process, which isn't hard. Bleeding edge, which is the, the Broadwell stuff that we're, we're pushing out now that's on the 14 nanometer, but our 22 nanometer process is pretty good. It's, it's pretty mature and um, works well for us. They're really big, I mean, it's a, a really big change, both CPU and GPU-wise for us on the SOC side, on the Atom side. Um, and like I said, the Linux stuff was, was a priority from early on. Um, and the Linux team ha has been involved, uh, you know, our open source team doing Linux drivers has been involved from very early on. We were at the, at the power on when the silicon first came back from the factories, doing the initial debug and development of our, of our driver stack. So Ben, who may be somewhere around here, was at that. Uh, Ken Gronke, who's on the Mesa team, was there helping. And um, we got you know, 3D games up and running and stuff within a day or two of getting stable silicon. So that was really exciting. Uh, so some of these slides you may think, oh, these are really pretty. How did he come up with those? Well, I didn't. That, these are mostly stolen from IDF. So hopefully they won't be too, too full of marketing stuff. But the, uh, the over, this is the overall architecture of the of the chip, so it's, it is an SOC, it's got a whole bunch of IP blocks on it, um, but the big changes are the new Atom up to quad core, and then the new HD graphics, which is um, not new from the client side, it's basically an Ivy Bridge graphics part, uh, but it's been chopped down and put onto the SOC. Uh, so if you're familiar or if you've been following our, our previous Atom stuff, you'll know that um, earlier chips used uh, uh, IP block from Imagination, uh, the PVR graphics stuff. And I'm sure everyone has a lot of love for their, for their stuff, and they'll be sad to see it go, but now we've got Gen Graphics instead, so you'll have to tolerate that. Um, and then, you know, it's got kind of similar feature set to what you'd see on a client part. You know, there's the CPU and uh, graphics power sharing and, you know, the same sort of ISA extensions for security and virtualization. And that sort of thing is all, is all present, so it's you know, it looks like a regular client CPU, and it actually has a similar speed. So, like I said, these are kind of the key the key changes. So, the big big one on the CPU side is going to the Silvermont architecture, um, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And then the graphics side going from the SGX, um, running at a at a lower frequency to the to the Gen graphics running at a higher frequency. And of course, it's a totally different rendering model too. It's not a deferred rendering deferred tile based rendering. It's it's immediate. Um, Resolutions increased, and in fact, we go up on the Linux drive. We go up higher than 25 by 16, thanks to the the mode setting architecture stuff that Daniel was talking about. We're able to um, change the display clock, the core display clock, at runtime if we need to bump up to an even higher resolution. Memory bandwidth is dramatically increased. So on some of these SKUs, like on the uh, convertible tablets and notebooks, you know, you get like regular PC style memory bandwidth, which is really great. And we went up to new USB as well. So that's that's also important, um, so you don't have to wait forever for your multi-gigabyte USB stuff. Uh, overall, um, this is what the, 
kind of basic block diagram looks like. And, and this, is, this is a bit different than what you would see on a, on, a, on a client platform. It doesn't have like a QPI bus. It's a custom ring fabric that we use on the Atom side, just you know, within the SOC. Um, one of the big differences that we have relative to the client parts, at least uh, since Sandy Bridge, we've had um, the GPU is able to share in a cache coherent way the last level cache on the CPU. And so they're both, the GPU and the CPU are, are integrated on the same die and they can share the last level cache. On here, they're integrated on the same die, but we do not have that cache sharing. So each of those uh, dual core chunks of IP has their own uh, shared cache, but it's independent of the, of the graphics. So that makes for um, uh, quite a different set of performance characteristics. So if you're tuning for performance on, on this part versus, say, an Ivy Bridge laptop, you, you're going to see uh, very different things because of that lack of cache sharing. Um, so you have to be careful about how you map and, and read back memory and, and also how, you're, how you set up your rendering and things like that. Um, and it has, a, so it has the Intel HD graphics plus the, um, the, the quick sync stuff that you would see on the client side. So it can do the regular video decode and encode you would see in the client space. And in addition to that, we've got a VP8 decode engine on these parts. Um, that's available and, and used in some cases. This one looks really marketing-like, but the, the kind of takeaway for this one is the, the, the huge improvements in, in power or performance you, you get to choose. The, the huge difference here is this, this is the first atom part that's out of order. So if you've looked at our previous uh, microarchitectures on the CPU side, they've been in order, maybe dual issue. Now we've got up to four cores out of order, and the performance is just dramatically improved. If you, if you use one of the old atoms, it's like using an ARM platform. You know, you're like, I don't want to do any builds on this. I don't want to actually log into this machine. I want to just copy stuff onto it and, and kind of pretend it's not there. This guy, you can log into it, and it's like using a Core 2 Duo laptop from a couple years ago. I mean, it's like reasonable speed. You, you don't want to stab your eyes out when you're using it. So it's a huge, huge improvement from that, from that point of view. And it's got the new architecture extension. So it's a, um, it's a reasonable CPU to deal with in terms of uh, having the feature set you're used to. And there's all the fab stuff if you're interested in the 3D gates. Um, so this is uh, some, some of the benchmarks we've done comparing the, the new Atom CPU side to, to some of the competition. Um, like I said, the, the other guys, you know, these are fast ARM CPUs, but they're still terrible, right? I mean, sorry if there are any ARM folks in here, but I, I just, I can't, I used Atom and like even our old generation Atom was pretty competitive, like it actually beat out some of the ARMs. And in using it, I'm like, I don't understand how the ARM guys even survive. Like, this is a terrible thing to use. I, I don't want to use this platform. This, this new one is like, it's significantly faster. So it's, you can see, I mean, these are spec in. So this is like what, you know, this is your current bench basically, right? And it's, it's way, way faster. And the power consumption is also lower. Some of these guys, you know, they're, I don't know if this is actually ISO power, but you can see the, at least the clock rate. Yeah, Greg's saying that Tegra even takes more power on this same benchmark and gets less performance. And I, I don't know. There's legal disclaimers at the end that I don't know what I'm talking about. So, yeah, I'll just agree with that. The, like I said, the next big chunk is the, is the graphics side. So getting rid of imagination. Um, you know, imagination is, for their faults, they're tuned to... Um, work in the mobile space and, and tend to be fairly power efficient and can achieve high performance. I mean, if you look at the new, latest iPad Airs, they've done pretty amazing things with that architecture. It's, um, it's, a, it's proven. Uh, I don't like to work on it because it's a, it's a closed source driver stack. It has a different architecture than, than what we have and I'm, I'm more used to ours. So I'm really happy about this change because we have a fully open source stack. Um, but that's mostly a personal preference. From, from, a, from an Intel perspective, I think we have a we have an opportunity here to really prove this architecture out in a, in a lower power envelope. And I think we're doing that in, in Bay Trail. So like, you can see that it's only got four EUs. Like it's a pretty simple chop down from the, from the, the client side Ivy Bridge. 
Um, so the, the performance is kind of scaled down on what you'd, to what you'd expect, minus the LLC sharing that I already talked about. Um, and all I can say is, in terms of the future, is just keep your eye on the space. It's going to get uh, pretty interesting this year and next year. And then I, I talked about the, the power and the video decode stuff. It's all available, too. Um, here you can see the, the gaming side. So this is basically comparing the graphics performance. Um, we're not, this isn't a leadership part by any means for, from a graphics perspective. It's, it's merely competitive. Um, to me, this is actually pretty impressive given that it is a, a fairly straightforward chop down versus like a, you know, a dedicated redesign for mobile. Um, the fact that we did this well uh, with, without a tremendous amount of effort uh, tells me that we have quite a bit of, of room to improve and the uh, subsequent parts should be, should be really nice. Plus, we've got an open source stack, so that's pretty exciting. And yeah, it beats the crap out of our old stuff. <laughs> I don't know if there are any media folks in here. There, there's so many acronyms and, and different codecs. But it does have, like, the, like I said, it has the, the, the same uh, encode and decode support and, and transcode support that you'd see in the client part. So um, that's nice from a, like teleconferencing or um, you know, video calling, that sort of thing, point of view. So it's, all that stuff is there. And that, that's actually a really nice feature of our, of our parts. And, I probably ought to know more about it, but I don't spend much time on the media side. On the display side, um, at 10 by 7, you can't really see this. This is a chamber of horrors. There are demons hanging people and torturing them. Uh, on the display side, the, the, the pipe stuff and the register block on the display uh, mostly matches what you would see on, a client, on the client side. But when you get out to the port side, they redesigned everything and did a custom, a custom implementation of the, of the display phi itself. That's the chamber of horrors, and it's been a, a thorn in our side. I think the hardware guys really take pleasure in torturing us. Um, it's just a totally different programming model. We have a very low level access to all of the phi characteristics and um, all of the filtering and things that get, get applied on, on, the, on the DAC for the... Um, for the Phi, so it, that's been a challenge to get, get right across a variety of configurations. Um, but on the plus side, we've got MIPI here, we've got um, four, four by lanes display port, and we can actually go up past 25 by 16, which was mentioned earlier. Um, I think we're at like 38 by 18 or something like that. Uh, so it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a bad display part either. And it's relatively low power. We have some um, power gating features that we can do. Like we, when, we sh when the pipes go off, we can actually power gate the whole display engine uh, like we do on the graphics side or on the render side. Um, when the GT is idle, we can power gate that. So we have that support on the display side now too, which is really nice. So we, you know, the, the, the low level aspect of it is a, is a pain, but we're mostly, we mostly have it under control now. So this is what we're shooting for. This is, this is a, a, like a display on idle case, you know, where you're just looking at your screen, but you're not doing anything. Um, or maybe you're rendering a little bit. You can see the graphics is lit up. But what we're shooting for on Linux is this. When the display goes off, we want the whole SOC to basically go off and power gate everything. So there's just some like, tiny microcontrollers and things that are still awake. But this is not a full S3 state. This is a, a runtime suspend state. So uh, the, the SOC architecture that we have now lets us get to really low power consumption during runtime. Are you going to do S3 because you are going to do that? Greg asks, are we going to bother with S3 because we can do runtime suspend? Uh, yeah, S3 in some cases can still save you a little bit more than a full runtime suspend case. So we'll support both, both S3 and runtime suspend all over the place. Going forward, if we can get parity between S3 and runtime suspend, I think at some point we may just implement S3 in terms of runtime suspend. But um, there is a, there's a logic and there's an overhead to all of the runtime stuff. So S3 is also simpler from a platform and implementation point of view. So there's trade-offs. 
So the upstream status of this, um, we started pushing these bits way back almost two years ago now. Uh, landed the initial graphic stuff in 3.6. Um, and the, the, and the full SROIX, that's our, our runtime suspend support, isn't pushed uh, upstream just yet in the, course, in the core side of things. And then on graphics, that's, that's pretty much done. We just have to get it, get it merged. Um, things really stabilize around 3.10, so if you're starting to get these platforms for yourself, um, don't do anything before 3.10, or you're going to be in that chamber of horrors that I talked about. Um, the display up and down clock I talked about, so that I, I don't think any of those super high-res display products are out on the market yet, but when they are, we'll be ready for them, so you'll be able to, to use those right away. RC6 is, is a feature on this too, um, and it works. I know some of you may have had problems with that. <laughs> RC6 on Baytrail is a different implementation than it is on the client side, and it's actually simpler, and it seems to be pretty stable. Um, we've got some some display power shutdown stuff like I talked about, some other display features that are actually not Baytrail specific, the dynamic refresh rate support. So like if the screen is mostly idle, you could actually drop the refresh rate, save some power on your, on your memory bandwidth, let your memory stay in self-refresh for longer. Uh, we have some bugs, um, again, Chamber of Horrors. The, this one we just fixed uh, the day before I caught my flight out here. And it, that had been driving me nuts for a week and a half, so I'm really set happy that we that we fixed that. So, um, if you're buying a a Bay Trail based platform on Amazon or something now, you, you would have run into that like right away. But we've got that under control now, so that should be fixed in the current kernels, and we'll push that back to stable. Um, and then there are some other issues, like Alan Alan Cox got this T100 machine with a Bay Trail T a tablet uh, SKU in it. And it had, um, it's actually a MIPI based panel on that, on his machine, but it showed up as a VGA for some reason. And, and he was, as he was trying to configure it, you know, he's like, oh, I can get it to work if I, if I program the VGA to do this. And it just so happened that he was programming the VGA in such a way that we were driving both VGA and, and MIPI with the same timings and the display happened to work. So there are still some things we have to work out on the MIPI side. We haven't tested it tremendously. Um, just in upstream Linux we have uh, on our Android trees, but uh, so, so we'll see some improvements there. On the Mesa side, it's been, it's been in for a long time since Mesa 9.2 and even before, I think. Uh, there's a lot of performance um, headroom here, like the performance for, for some things is actually looking pretty good, um, but for other things we're like at half the speed that we could be, so the Mesa team is just kind of continually improving performance there. Um, Ian is probably not here since we were out last night until about 6.30 a.m. Um, but you can ask him later when he shows up. On the media side, um, it's been supported in LibVA as of the 1.2.1 release. The VP8 stuff is in progress. Um, the way that the VP8 bits are integrated, they, it, it shares some logic in terms of power gating and interrupt support with the i915 IP block. So there are some i915 changes required, and then there's a, a bunch of a, a, a driver in our Android tree that's that's published and open source, but it's not integrated upstream. And I don't know if if the the people we have working on it are actually going to push it upstream or not. It might land in staging at some point, but uh, it's it's pretty ugly still. So. Um, we're working on that. There are a few platforms out there now, uh, mostly Windows stuff. Um, I, I keep refreshing on Amazon until because uh, I want to see the, the Android tablets come out, but I think those will be coming in the next couple of months. Um, or if you go to Shenzhen, China, you can have them build you one right now. Uh, that's, that's been another kind of issue, but people building weird configurations and saying, hey, it doesn't work. Um, and if you're, so if you're looking for the SKUs, I just included them here. You can also jump on Wikipedia, those are all there. But um, if you're on Newegg or something and you want to look, there's a, a new uh, NUC, the next unit of computing, um, Intel's, it's kind of a side project for Intel. Nice little tiny form factor device, uh, but it has, there's one with Baytrail in it now. And there's, there's a new one with Haswell and a new one with Baytrail. And so both of those are really nice platforms for a, for a tiny device like that. And the Baytrail one hopefully is fanless. Um, 
so that's a fun way to get your get your feet wet wet with Bay Trail if you want. And then there's there's new stuff coming, so just keep your keep looking. Okay, legal disclaimer. Anything I said, you can't hold against me because I'm I'm a fool. Yeah. So, any questions? Hello. I can hear you. Uh, so. You're going to be, on the Mesa side of the graphics, you fully support OpenGL ES 3.0, and when you bring this over to Android, you're obviously going to be supporting it there as well. Will you be bringing desktop OpenGL to the Android side while being able to create it with an EGL context? Will we be bringing full OpenGL to Android? Um, that's not something that we're going to stop people from doing. I, I don't think Google has any plans to, to expose the full GL API through their framework, um, which is really what would be required. But if you want to take, a, you know, build Cyanogen with Mesa and, and, a, and enable full GL in your build and then do NDK stuff, that's definitely doable, I would think. Um, they, on Android, there's like some additional complexity because they've got a GL wrapper library to, to kind of unify the, the feature set. Um, but yeah, it's something that something that you could definitely do if you wanted to. Um, I, I guess Ian's still not here, but he, he would be a good one to ask about that too. Any other questions? No? Cool. Well, I'm glad I got to brag about this. I've been excited about this platform, and I'm glad it's finally out there. Thanks. So next talk is going to be about Nouveau. Uh, it's gonna be